Hey, it's Nicholas with the conclusion of Space Time Dimensionality in the Science of Consciousness in a quick part five summary of the extensive terrains we've covered in the preceding four parts, plus a look ahead to some ongoing journeys. So first, let's look at the landscape we've already traveled. In part one, I introduced angle bracket symbolism for components of conscious experience, which then allowed us to associate formal spatial and temporal coordinates to those components. Then in part two, we looked at four different categories of spatial theories of conscious experience, virtual, inner, outer co-located, and outer non-co-located, all of which are types of representationalist approach. And we looked at one way of arbitrating experimentally between various kinds of spatial dimensionality using gravimetry and also briefly touched on other ways to see which, if any, of these categories accurately describe what's going on in nature. So those other ways might include additional spatial theoretical considerations, such as locality and geometry, as well as further data collection, for example, concerning the details of neural codes. So then in part three, we turn to time, uh, mainly there in a special relativistic setting, where movements in space and the movement of time can't completely be dissociated. So the proper special relativistic treatment of conscious experience led to two kinds of preferred or distinguished frames. One for determining uh, the brain dynamical simult simultaneity, which determines uh, the contents of experience at a given experiential moment, and the other to do with instantaneous painting action occurring at uh, spatially separated locations at the same time, thus creating a frame of independent or invariant simultaneity. So one way to summarize part three is to look at the total number of preferred frames, uh, which ranges from one to two N uh, associated with ex the existence of experiential systems in the universe. And then in uh, part four, uh, we took a first iteration based around the temporary expository assumption of just one preferred frame associated with uh, the existence of experience. And then on a second iteration, we discussed this proliferation of possibilities as one potential expression of what I call the fragmentation of time. So those part four iterations were centered around a non-standard conceptualization of time, primarily as a movement, which can be framed in a way that somewhat naturally leads to the mixing of spatial and temporal distance in the relativistic metric. More importantly though, as we discussed, construing time as a movement and addressing the idea of the fragmentation and then recoherence of that movement gives rise to a powerful and provocative alternative to the somewhat bewildering implications of a relativistic block, for block universe outlook. And beyond that even, it offers us a new possibility for the journey our particular universe is on. Instead of big crunch, big rip or big chill endings, the fragmentation and recoherence view offers a scenario in which our universe departed, in a sense, from a larger physical ground by a fragmentation event, but will eventually re-enter that same ground, fully alive and functional, so to speak, not crunched or ripped or dissipated, when all the various fragmentary temporal movements have, re have re-established coherence, harmony and alignment. So now clearly that landscape does not make up a finished work, so to speak. Almost all of it is under active investigation and we could frame the topics thereby investigated as the kind of the frontiers of that landscape. Over the next few slides, I'll distill out a number of reasonably well-formed questions related to investigational frontiers. Here, I just offer a bird's eye view of the categorization of three distinct groups that questions could be filed under. So conventionally, theoretical inquiries directed towards identifying frontiers that can only be advanced by data-based arbitration of theory classes. And we've touched on a couple of data gathering efforts that could help advance inquiry here. So we've talked about gravimetry and brain dynamical investigations concerning dynamically orthodox and unorthodox uh, physics. So then there's a set of frontiers that could be thought of as internal to an ongoing theoretical journey. For example, further examination of ideas in, in these presentations in relation to work in conventional quantum theory, conventional relativity, <coughs> high dimensional physics, including, but not limited to string theory and M theory. And another potentially profitable internal frontier, as I'll go into in a little, 
uh, in a couple of slides time is to put ideas presented here alongside quantum theories of consciousness and see what emerges from that conjunction. So finally, we could say there are a group of far flung frontiers with perhaps no obvious direct relationship to other scientific fields or subfields stemming from a conceptualization conceptualization of time as a movement and then flowering into the idea of fragmentation and recoherence and then going beyond even that to speculate about light like movements after recoherence a speculation that then spins off a further inquiry frankly an inquiry that i hold to be one of the most productive for humankind and simultaneously one of the most neglected the inquiry into the question of what matter really is so okay from the far-flung and apparently esoteric to the first of three slides collecting together some relatively concrete questions. Questions concerning space here uh, in the science of consciousness on this first slide. So how do outer representationisms affect the first instance non-local transmission from brain encoding to distant uh, locations, uh, co-located with objects or not? Without any mechanism, uh, non-locality appears to persist beyond the first instance. And with a physical mechanism, uh, other questions arise. So, for example, what is that mechanism made of and how does it develop biologically? Then for object co-located outer representationisms, what's the transmission speed? If it occurs at light speed or less, how do representations of the distant stars, for example, appear almost immediately on opening the eyes? And then, although I didn't cover this in any detail in previous parts, every theory must address the natural order occurrence of three geometries, one relating to the objects of physics studies, another to the informational locations at which the brain encodes those physics studied objects, and a third related to conscious experiential images themselves. Then moving on to data-based arbitrations of theoretical possibilities, will advances in, in neuroscience provide any helpful data in the future? And is there any prospect for launching in the near term rigorous experience related gravimetric research projects? And moving on to time, the most basic question concerns the delta T issue. That's the offset between brain activity and corresponding conscious experiential components. As I mentioned a little earlier, dynamically unorthodox physics with an active experience to brain information transfer can severely limit the sign and magnitude of delta T. In the relativistic arena, how many preferred frames does the existence of experiential systems give rise to? Beyond relativity, is it either right or helpful or both to conceive of relativistic time, experiential time, and quantum time as three different kinds? If there are multiple kinds, and even if there are not, does the hypothesis of time fragmentation and recoherence suggest or even establish another kind of arrow of time? Relatedly, perhaps, uh, does the conceptualization of time as a movement rather than as a static uh, set of coordinates produce uh, constructive, productive, scientific forwards movement? Then there are a plethora of potential research topics and projects and directions for each of those. How to find the time, so to speak. Put differently, is there more than usual call for a distributed, coordinated, multi-investigator approach to the question of time? Finally, what are the possibilities and prospects for theory, cat theory category arbitra arbitration by uh, data, whether that data is collected by experiments or by other means? So um, should we look to this, or are we more in a proto-scientific phase for time where creation of categories rather than arbitration between them is the main priority? And finishing up with my third group of questions, which concern the relationship between space-time approaches and quantum approaches to consciousness as two sub-schools. Quantum approaches to consciousness spring from a disparate collection of motivations. For example, state vector reduction, problems with classical neurobiological hypotheses, non-algorithmic computation, uh, or looking for explanations for psi or um, psychokinesis. But as far as I can see, all the quantum schools neglect conscious experiential angle bracket symbols and their associated row, tau, space-time coordinates. So is it time to see what the space-time schools and the quantum schools can offer to each other? So here are some possible linkages or conversation topics where I put the space-time viewpoint first before the CF uh, and a quantum perspective on perhaps the same issue second. So we have 
instantaneous painting compared with non-local simultaneity of state vector reduction. We have resolution of non-locality in theories of conscious experience by dimensions and physical construction uh, compared to resolution by appeal to quantum non-locality. We have a non-algorithmic non action originating in top-down timelessness contrasted with, or perhaps added to, bottom-up quantum gravity mechanisms. And finally, psi or PK from novel R rho space distance metrics and or instantaneous action in row space compared with coupling quantum alleged ran randomness to a distant intention. So in final summary, space and time are tremendously productive, non-separable frontiers of the science of consciousness and curiously neglected. Space-time considerations for science of conscious experience can and should inform work at the frontiers of physics. There are at least two major consciousness-related experiments that can advance space-time understanding. Gravimetry, near the conscious experiences, which could provide novel data about total dimensionality, primarily spatial, and the dynamically orthodox unorthodox physics program, again, potentially limiting relative time offset uh, delta T of experience relative to brain activity. So at some space-time locus, a mutual conversation between macro space-time and quantum theorists of consciousness should occur. And finally, finally, almost, uh, time rather than space may be, after all, the final frontier. For example, relativistic simultaneity, time as movement, temporal hierarchies, and a fourth arrow of time all present intriguing possibilities. So I'll leave you with just a couple of reflections. We began with almost total ignorance about the problems of space and time in conscious experience. At least I did when I started this work about 10 years ago. Then by developing a clear physics linked symbolism for key aspects of the phenomenon, we were able to make tremendous progress, at least in structuring our ignorance and somewhat in finding experimental and theoretical arbitrations and definitely laying out the frontiers for, for further work in the future. So of course, I'm totally biased but I would offer all of that to the court as further evidence for the power and beauty of mathematical physics in advancing our understanding of nature. Now, some people, people who are as appreciative of that power and beauty as I am, and so share my great interest in preserving its integrity, some people think that introducing conscious experience as an object of study would be the end of rigor and precision in mathematical physics. But as I've shown elsewhere, not introducing it leaves the whole of science, including physics, in a very difficult position, to say the least. Whereas, as we've seen over these five parts, introducing conscious experience to mathematical physics opens the door to a host of new avenues for resolving long-standing problems, notably the problems associated with time. I'm Nicholas. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you again soon.